In my previous video, I demonstrated with phase cancellation that many of these analog modeling plugins were extremely similar in their sound. Based off of the large amount of phase cancellation that I demonstrated in those tests, most people were convinced that the differences were trivial at best. But although phase cancellation is the gold standard scientific inarguable test to see the differences between two signals, I didn't actually quantify anything at all in that video. So this had the effect of being really polarizing. Many people said, oh yeah, you're right. Whereas some other people thought that my methodology in that video was lacking scientific rigor. Of course, this being YouTube, there was a bunch of trolls taking the video out of context and there was a few people moaning that I sell courses. Oh, by the way, my new course EQ Enlightenment is now live. Thank you to everyone who pre-ordered it. But yeah, I'm not going to waste airtime here addressing the troll comments. Instead, I made this video for the genuine people who actually did want to see a more robust methodology and quantified results. So that's what we're going to do in this video. But before we start talking all of the technical stuff, let's just look at the results. Here they are. So if you didn't care about the specific methodology or anything else that went into this test, you can just look at that and see the only plugin that did anything remotely interesting in terms of non-linearity here was the Slate API type EQ. That did something, some unspecified magical thing was happening there. To be honest, I don't know if it sounds good, if it sounds bad. I have no opinion on what that is actually doing to the sound, but that seems to be the only plugin that was doing anything nonlinear at all in terms of the EQs. But let's have a look more closely what actually did for these tests and what the results actually mean. If you want to download the exact session files that I was using to get these results, or you want to listen to the rendered out audio results from this test, well, you can just download all of that. It's a zip file containing the session files, the rendered files, the source audio files, and the results in Excel. So check out the link in the description and you can download those, of course, for free. So I'll start off with a recording of Pink Noise, a drum recording, and a techno track. Then I put a fancy plugin on one track and Pro Q2 on another and try to match Fab Filter to the fancy plugin. The fancy plugin will always have a 6 dB high shelf boost and a 6 dB low mid bell cut unless the plugin doesn't have that functionality, in which case I just do whatever is closest. After I'm happy with the matching, I bounce that out onto this track here. Then I take the dry recordings and combine it with that delta. And then I bounce that out again to get this bottom track here, which I've called the compensated signal, which is the original signal with the delta mixed in. And then I calculate the difference between the original recordings and the new compensated signal with the delta mixed in. And that difference in RMS level is the difference between the two plugins. The bigger the RMS number, the bigger the difference, meaning the more unique the plugin is and the worse that I've been able to match it. And if it's really high, like above 1 dB, that means that I've failed to match it. This way we can better quantify what the difference is between the fancy plugin and Pro-Q2 when matched to that fancy plugin. So how do we interpret these results? Well, the J and D, or the just noticeable difference, is often cited as being around 1 dB. So if we take 1 dB as the threshold for passing or failing this test, all of the EQ plugins fail the test. But if we take half a dB, then maybe the API Slate plugin is sort of on the borderline of doing something that you could actually hear in one plugin instance. However, that's not the full story. Even if you look at some older articles in the literature around the 1960s, they'll state that the J and D is frequency dependent. But if you look at some more recent research, you can get a better picture. This table here shows us the different J and Ds at different frequencies at different listening levels. This is just done with sine waves, so this isn't representative of normal music. However, you can see that if you listen to low frequency bass at a low volume, you might not even be able to hear the difference between a 9 dB change, which is huge. In fact, at low volumes, regardless of the frequency, the J and D is quite large. I've circled here everything with the J and D less than 1 decibel. This is everything less than half a decibel, everything less than a third of a decibel, and finally less than a quarter of a decibel. So I think it's safe to say that with certainty we can disregard any result quieter than a quarter of a dB. 90 dB is slightly louder than you typically listen to music at under optimal conditions in a critical listening type room like a mastering studio. So if we instead look at the 80 dB results and take the average we come up with 0.5 dB and as this test was based on sine waves and not listening to actual music, I think it would be fair to use half a dB as the benchmark, but definitely if it's quieter than a quarter of dB, we can definitely say that we can disregard that. 
So what is actually here on our results? Right at the top, the top two, which say benchmark, these are both there as a type of falsification. What I mean by that is, if these were really low as well, then we would know that there's something wrong with our test and our test would be invalid. Because this is an example of incorrectly matched EQs. The first one is the Mug Air EQ and FabFilter Pro Q2, simply with the same setting on both displayed. So both have 10K and both have 6 dB boost selected on a higher shelf. Now, I'm assuming that shouldn't be identical. That shouldn't match because of the different cues, because the different ways that these filters are set up. They should sound different because if you just put in the knob values, you shouldn't get a good match. And the second one is the SSL emulation from Slate match with Pro Q2 as well. So I'm just putting in the same knob values and I'm expecting that the knob values don't match up between the two EQs and they don't. So we can see there, they don't cancel out anywhere near as much as the other ones which I manually matched. The rest of the results consist of the plugins which you see, so I'm never going to be able to get them to match absolutely perfectly because I'm just doing this manually by hand. Despite that, we see that the differences are so small in almost all of the cases under the column absolute variability that it's zero for almost everything apart from the API and the benchmarks for drums, and it's close to zero for the techno track that I put through it. Is a bit more variable for the pink noise. The Neve there is on the threshold of the half dB. But if we then magnify the results, we turn up the delta by 20 dB, which is like having 10 of the same plugin instances, which you would never do in a session because you're never going to put 10 of the same plugin instances with the same EQ setting on the same sound. So this is ridiculously exaggerated. But let's just say you went and did that. Well, the only plugin that would pass the test then would be, again, the API plugin from Slate. Everything else would fail the test again. You wouldn't hear the difference in a blind test. Despite the fact that there is something different about the API emulation plugin, I'm not going to have an opinion on whether that thing is good or bad. It might be a good thing that it sounds better, or it might be a bad thing where it actually sounds worse. I don't really have an opinion on it, but it is doing some unspecified thing to the sound. All of the other plugins, even with that 20 dB magnification, would completely fail an ABX test for most people, according to the JND in the scientific literature. The columns on the right under absolute variability compounded is when I have boosted the delta 20 dB to simulate having 10 plugin instances with the identical EQ setting on the identical sound in the session, which is obviously exaggerated. But even then, most of the plugins with the drum recording and the techno track are under our half dB threshold, apart from the SQL pass EQ is just on that threshold. One thing to note is that with the compounding, I'm multiplying the inaccuracies of me matching it in the low end. So there's some low end rumble on the Neve plugin and on a couple of plugins that when you high pass filter just at 30 hertz, it dramatically reduces the number that we're getting for the result. And as we saw on the table previously, the very low frequencies have a very high JND anyway. I really don't think that's important for the audibility of these tests. So with the Delta boosted up 20 dB on the pink noise, you can see the results are a bit more varied and many of them are over that half a dB threshold. But if we look at the drums and the techno, which is actual music rather than just noise, we can see that almost everything has an inaudible difference even after we boosted the Delta 20 dB. One of the more surprising results was from that air EQ because a few people said in the comments, why are you boosting the mid bell? boost the air shelf because that's the one that everyone uses and loves and that's where the magic is in the air frequencies because it just does something which no other EQs do. Well actually, if you actually look what it's doing, all it does is when you boost up the high frequency with that shelf, it boosts everything up. It does a gain increase across the entire spectrum. It boosts all frequencies. So when you boost the higher shelf, you're tricked into thinking it's doing something amazing because it's just turning the gain up. But when you know that and adjust for the gain, in my tests at least, it just looks like a bog standard normal digital shelf where it's just turning everything up. Once you expose that magic behind the curtain, that has one of the lowest deltas in my entire test. It seems to be doing nothing else 
other than a bog standard digital high frequency shelf. So I'm going to be happy to close this chapter on EQ and start talking about some other interesting topics. But before I do, I just want to address some remaining criticisms that I had on the previous two videos. Probably the most common criticism I got was that you could still hear the delta. And one person accused me of being deaf because he thought I couldn't hear the delta. Of course I can hear the delta. And you're not supposed to hear nothing. It shouldn't just be complete silence. So now after watching this video, the delta should make more sense. It doesn't need to be minus infinity because that would just mean it's mathematically identical and that was never the claim and that's just not expected at all. What we want to hear is a sufficiently low delta that it makes no difference in the actual mix. So if you're confused by that in the last video hopefully that makes more sense now. But just to show you what I mean in a slightly different way, if we take Nova twice with the same setting and change the gain 0.1 dB which is the smallest possible change in gain on Nova and it's so small you would never be able to hear that change in the mix. However, when we listen to the Delta, it's quite audible. The next criticism I got was that I did it wrong because I used white noise and that is the wrong type of noise, I should have used pink noise instead. I don't personally find the case for using pink noise over white noise that compelling and important in doing these kinds of tests, but if people want to see pink noise instead of white noise, I don't care that much about it, we just use pink noise for these tests because it seems to be the one that people want to see. Another criticism I got was all of that stuff I was doing to try and get the curve bender to null in my last video was completely stupid because apparently the only thing that's going on there is a linear phase anti-aliasing filter. Or actually no, this isn't the case. It does have a very steep anti-aliasing filter, but I was already taking that into consideration. But at least in my test, I got maximum phase cancellation by doing a 48 dB per octave minimum phase low pass filter, not a linear phase. But if you want to see exactly what I did this time to get that phase cancellation, you can just download the files as I say they're freely available and you can look at the setting I was using. But either way, there is very weird phase stuff going on on that particular plugin. That's the weirdest plugin in terms of phase characteristics. A genuine question which a few people had was, okay, well, I might not be able to hear the difference with one instance, but put that across your whole session. You've got maybe 10 instances of this EQ. Isn't that going to mount up and have a cumulative effect? So I took that on board and that's why I did the cumulative thing in this video. And again, this is wildly exaggerated. You would never have so much build up in that delta because it would be different settings on different instruments. You're not going to stack it 10 times on the same sound with the same EQ setting. It doesn't make any sense. But even doing that with such an extreme artificial accumulation effect across the session, even then the differences are so low they're still below the JND. Another common thing that people said was workflow. Okay, they might sound identical, but they don't work identically. So I can boost different things and get different sounds in a quicker way with a Poltec than using a digital EQ. Well, I don't really buy that because if you can't work effectively with a digital EQ and quickly dial in a high shelf and a bell cut in like two seconds, then you probably want to learn how to use an EQ rather than just buying different EQ plugins to try and twiddle knobs in a different way. Maybe it's a bit cheeky, but in that case, you might want to buy my EQ course. Another thing I want to address, especially because of the thumbnail in that first EQ video that I did, most people understood the message of my video, but some people thought I was calling out plugin developers and accusing them of being scammers because they were saying they're doing this analog modeling EQ, but in fact, it's not analog modeling EQ and it doesn't sound anything like the analog hardware. I didn't say that at all. That wasn't my point at all. My point was you don't need all of these different plugins for all these different flavors because there's no real big audible difference between them if you know how to use an EQ properly. That was the whole point of the video. I was just saying that the marketing was hyperbolic and they're trying to convince you that you need this for a different flavor and this will make your mixes sound great. So it's this whole idea that different plugins have different flavors. You need to buy a bunch of different EQs to get different flavors. Really? And all of that sort of stuff. Let's have a look at some of these marketing claims which are currently on the websites of some of the companies I did these tests for in this video. It always sounds good. Silky top end and tight lows, it's impossible not to improve your sound. A sound that is rich in character, kicks will sound round and full and snares will splat through your monitors and vocals will appear as sweet as honey. One of those rare EQs that it's almost impossible to get anything but a good sound out of. Add brightness to your mixes without harshness and craft a fat mud free low end. 
in part character and style to any source, drums, synths, vocals, guitars, strings, bass, you name it. The legendary airband enhances almost every source. The thing that I was calling the scam was the hyperbolic language that these companies use to get you to think that it will give you a different colour in your mix, or if you run this instrument through this plugin it's going to make it sound better, enhance the higher frequencies, add warmth and colour and all of these adjectives. It's not like I'm making it up, you can just go to the website and read how it will make your mix sound so fantastic. I was absolutely not saying that anyone was being dishonest in making actual emulations. Maybe some of those emulations are real honest attempts to get close to the actual analog hardware and maybe it even sounds so close you can't hear the difference. But that was a completely different claim to the one that I actually had in my video. There was a couple of more nerdy comments talking about band interactions, time domain stuff and thresholds at which the non-linear effects might kick in so using sustained noise might not trigger that. So I wanted to address all of those concerns by using a drum recording so it's got a lot of transient information, a techno track, so it's really loud, so should be in that range of where we're gonna get the non-linear effects, and then the pink noise just to do the bog standard entire spectrum. A few people actually said that none of those tests in my last video nulled because null means minus infinity. No, that's not right. If that was the case, you wouldn't be able to do any null testing in the analog domain, and specific hardware null testing devices wouldn't have user-definable threshold knobs. Another comment I got a few times was, my test results are invalid because I'm selling a course. <laughs> okay. The last thing I want to mention, I called it the plugin scam, but so far I've only talked about EQ. But don't worry, I'm not only going to be talking about EQ, I also want to do a video on compression, it's just a lot more difficult to make a video on compression when comparing the differences between different plugins. So it's a bit of a technical challenge, I'm going to have to think more about the methodology, how I can actually display those results. So that's why I've not done a video yet, because it's just difficult to do, but hopefully I'm going to do it at some point. But anyway, I didn't just make this channel to bash plugin developers, my next video in fact is going to be my top plugin recommendations, and all of them are going to be 100% free plugins. 